Is everyone here? Good evening. Good evening. All right, much better, much better. We're going to go ahead and get started. This is our monthly community board meeting. Today is Wednesday, April 17th, and we're going to get started with our first public hearing item, which is National Grid. They have their team here, and we'll allow them to come up and introduce themselves. And they're going to be presenting on the Metropolitan Rehabilitation Project. So anyone who's been driving in the neighborhood recently has run into traffic on Evergreen, this is the opportunity to hear a little bit more. All right, so let's keep it civil. They're here to provide information, to take concerns, answer your questions. I give this over to National Grid. Let's welcome them. Good evening. My name is Renee McClure. I am the manager of community and customer management for National Grid. I cover all of Brooklyn. And so we are here tonight uh, on the request of uh, Celeste and team to talk about the work that's taking place in the uh, area. Just to give you a background, we do major work like this. We have a process that's in place. Reach out to the board and provide information about what's going on with the project. As well, we'll have a team here to let them introduce themselves. But the purpose of us being here today is to talk about the project, which is a five-year initiative. And so we're going across from one part of Brooklyn to the south part of Brooklyn to the north part of Brooklyn. So it's a very, very big major undertaking. We're going to have a few people talk about the extent of the project. As well as, um, our on-site. Uh, supervisor who works the project with us here on site and also dial in the project manager. So if there's any other questions, so I'm going to turn it over to Fabio, who's doing the outreach on the community side. Fabio. Hey all, Fabio Perla here, running the the community outreach program for the uh, Metro Reliability Project. So first to kind of zoom out, short version. Uh, uh, the current work that you're seeing along Central is uh, one of a five-year-long program started on Linden Boulevard eventually its way out to Green Bank. good volume good all right eventually gonna make its way out to Green Bank to uh, strengthen gas infrastructure in Brooklyn in light of, of development and evolving sands over time um, so right now the phase is uh, finishing along uh, Evergreen uh, onto Gates turning its way up and then going along central. Um, so uh, to that end, as we continue to move away across central, ending at Flushing Avenue, community board four ends, uh, myself, my colleague Darren Swim, we've been out doing outreach businesses to some of the uh, government offices by and to uh, residents as well, giving them a heads up about work, taking questions, concerns we can, making sure everybody's in the loop as possible and when we aren't able to reach we have these fact sheets some of you might have. for anyone that doesn't have one I'm gonna leave us on this table back here uh, to at some point at the end on the fact sheet as well and of course we we'll speak to people uh, whatever questions they have I am I can here we also have a hotline number uh, a website and an email address that way folks who we can't reach at the door are able to get in touch with us you know whenever it is that, that their schedule allows. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the long and short of the outreach program. Um, if anybody has any questions, concerns, unless anybody else from the team wants to come in. I'm Dave Russo. I'm on the job every day. I'm in charge of the job. Um, we try to work with the community making sure everybody, you know, is, is safe and all that. And if there's any issues, they can come to me. Thanks, Dave. Uh, again, my name's Darren. I'm part of the outreach team. Uh, we understand that projects like this have impacts in the communities that, that they're working in. So this, everything that Fabio just explained and really alluded to is uh, part of our effort to make sure that we're consistently sharing information with folks who are going to be impacted by construction. Uh, that's why we've set up a website. We've set up an outreach phone number um, that folks can call with any questions or concerns about the project. Um, I believe I just mentioned this. We have a website. Um, we post we post uh, weekly updates to the website. We have a weekly e-newsletter program. It basically um, gives you a forecast of what to expect from construction for the week ahead. Um, and you're able to, I feel like this is cutting in and out. Maybe not. Um, and you're able to sign up for these updates to get them sent directly to your email inbox on our website, in the top right corner. You just enter in your email address and zip code. Uh, 
uh, and you'll start getting those uh, updates from the mornings um, consistently. Um, I think uh, I think at this point we could probably open it up for any questions from the board or the group. So I believe this is new infrastructure, right, Dave? Yeah, hold on. It's, it's all new infrastructure. Everything has been, we go through a full process, making sure that all the bases are covered, the environment, the bioswales, the drainage systems, any utility that we cross, if there's clear, proper clearances, everything is taken a good uh, eye on. March 2019 date there refers to the current phase, so that's when we uh, continued past Palmetto on Evergreen. Um, the old form of this fact sheet that went out in the last phase had a different range of dates to refer to the work on Evergreen from uh, Decatur to Palmetto. Um, yeah, so that was a previous so we had other fact sheets that referred to that. We kind of keep them relatively grouped within a phase just so that rather than give uh, a timeline of, you know, uh, this huge timeline, try to keep it a bit more more specific to this area. No, sure. yeah. Fair point. We, we can maybe work to, to get a little bit ahead of stuff like that. It's, it's a more than fair point, so we'll, we'll take note of that. And so I have a question as well. So this is one project that National Grid is doing in the neighborhood, but I'm sure there are other projects that come up. How is that handled internally? Is there communication just to make sure that we don't have too many streets uh, being blocked off at the same time? So we have a, a group that's called Resource Planning, and they schedule the work uh, as far as um, that type of things. We do at sometimes have many projects, different projects going on, because not only are we doing a major project like this, we have uh, leak prone pipes that we have to replace. That's a, pro that's a mandated project. We have local 30, that's another initiative for safety. There are a lot of things going on. We do try, we try not to stay on the same street at the same time, but we do have a number of projects that we have to address from a mandatory perspective. Okay. Yeah, so So we do have a, a plan that's not resource planning's responsibility. It's the project manager's responsibility at looking at how that all those things come into. When we did find out that there was a concern, we did go to address it. You want to expand about because uh, I know we do reach out to MTA because then we have to get those bus stops moved. We have to get approval to do that. Yeah. Yeah. What I would do is uh, normally reach out to MTA, get a schedule from them notify them, get a printout. We would print out a brand new um, schedule and the location of the bus, bus stop and post it. Uh, and, and just as a quick supplement, that information uh, we've cross posted as well from the MTA's website. We've used their information on our website and through our email newsletter as well. Um, so, yeah. um, I have a question because I live where all the construction is and our streets were totally shut down. Not only the construction of housing or whatever is going on, but I see the sign said DOT, so when I see National Grid, I'm like, who is shutting down all the, um, the blocks? You had Wilson Avenue shut down, you had Central Avenue shut down, you had Evergreen shut down, you had Cooper with construction in the middle. I couldn't find out where to get a bus. I finally went with the Schaefer, there's the bus that comes down there, but since there's so much confusion, you, you're missing a whole three or four bus stops 
between Horsey all the way up to um, Bushwick and Cooper. So for me, I have to get on the L and go all the way to Canarsie to get on the 60 bus to go the opposite direction. I mean, there's no signs, no nothing out. And I did call the community board because I was all sitting up there confused. So I know a lot of people felt the same way. And you have construction on every corner without any warning. Some, some of those jobs are in National Grids. There's actually the city doing sewer work mm -hmm. on a few of the blocks. And there are also do, DOTs also doing uh, milling and paving. So be, besides National Grid. But everybody shouldn't be doing it at the same exact yeah. time. You shut us down. Uh, yeah, they, they need they need to be some sort of uh, collaboration with some of these uh, city agencies and you guys because you can't keep shutting everything down. And and when I came down now, when I ca I come down here, uh, if Bushwick at uh, six o'clock is traffic bumper to bumper going towards East New York, and then we're coming down Central, and you close Central because you can't come to Linden. So now, when you go to Linden, you make me go back into Evergreen and Bushwick because I got to go all the way back around to come here. So, you know, you need to close the street. If one is going up, keep the other one closed where you're coming down. It's a rocket sign. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to do that. And let the people come on this side because Bushwick is full, Central is closed, Evergreen you can't touch. So where are we going to go? So in regards to Bushwick, that's not national grid. But I do agree, you know, we have to see how we can collaborate more because when we get, when we get the permit to move forward, we get the permit to move forward. So, you know, we, I'm not putting DOT out there, but they, they give us the permit. So we're moving forward. If they give it to us, we believe it's okay to move forward. So I, I, I hear you, but there's some projects, because we're out there, a lot of times they think it's National Grid, but it's really not. And that particular one in Bushwick is not National Grid. But there are some cases where we're out there where we have to move our lines so they can finish the rest of their work. So. Any other questions that we'll be moving on? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sorry for the interview. And if you need to reach us, Celeste knows how to reach us. She knows how to reach us. And please visit the website and please sign up for, um, to get more information about what's going on with the projects because we're really trying to be proactive in sharing that information. Thank, thank you. you. So these guys right here, especially Fabio, is on the ground. He is literally walking the streets and handing out material. We left some here on the tables, but he is walking the ground. Yeah. And he gives his number that if someone needs to reach him, we'll, we'll definitely go there and follow up. Uh, generally along Central, I try, uh, I, I try to stay you know, where active construction is and then approximately two weeks ahead, uh, leaving these fact sheets you know, whenever possible, whenever I can't reach folks. You know, we'll we'll continue to loop back around and, and get more out there as well. And and as mentioned, we'll leave a nice stack uh, on this table back here. If there are specific uh, senior communities or housing that that we should be reaching out to, that that you know somebody personally that we should, you know, coordinate with and, and make sure that we're handing materials to. Celeste, okay, we'll, we'll check back. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so before we move on to our second agenda item, we do have our council member, one of our council members with us this evening, council member Rafael Espinal. Let's give him a warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. I uh, just came by to say hello and really catch up with everyone and kind of talk about what we've been working on in City Hall uh, the past few months. As you know, I did run for public advocate. I did not make it. I'm still your council member. I'm very proud and very happy to be a council member. Uh, and we continue the great work that I talked about. Um, and as a city council member, I do believe that you know, it's important uh, for me to really focus on the issues uh, that is affecting here us in Bushwick, but how can we make also systematic change across the city? And this, you know, the next few months, we'll be talking a lot about the city's budget. What's gonna be in the budget? How is that funding gonna affect our communities? And there's one big ticket item that I've been fighting for, and I hope that people in Bushwick can join me, and is push 
for the Department of Education to fund $50 million to get wellness coordinators in every single school. And what is the wellness coordinator? The wellness coordinator will be in charge of creating a wellness program for every student in those schools. I believe we have healthy school lunches in every school, we should have nutrition programming, and there's a, not a new technique, but a new technique we're seeing in our schools, and it's actually mindfulness and meditation in our classrooms. And the reason I'm focusing on this so much is because for so many years we've been pumping money, making money into education and not figuring out, not looking at the root causes of why our children are not performing. And the reason our children are not performing is because they come into school with issues already. They're not being fed properly. They're probably coming from the homeless shelter, are not able to focus because of things they're dealing with at home. And a wellness coordinator would, would be able to give our schools and our students the tools they need to live a healthy lifestyle so they can perform better, focus better, and be able to do better in the test and be able to get to better schools in the future. So that's something I'm really focusing on uh, in the budget in the next few months. Uh, of course, here in Bushwick, you know, every council member does have discretionary funding. I'm working with local nonprofits to make sure our nonprofits are, are fully funded. I'm working uh, with our capital budget to make sure our agencies and our schools uh, have the best computers, making sure the city has the money to fix our roads. Uh, and, you know, and we, and I'm looking uh, at, at other 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 big items in the budget you know last year we were successful in passing um, the 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 cards, the fair fares for lower income New Yorkers and we're looking at how else can we enhance the budget to look at other so you know it's gonna be a lively discussion over the next two or three months uh, but besides that we all know that the Bushwick community plan is something that continues to uh, be an ongoing conversation a few years now uh, as I said from the beginning I'll continue saying I stand with the community uh, my main concerns and, and my main goal is to build as much affordable housing preserve the character of our communities and also get the capital investments our communities need and deserve so that we can continue making Bushwick uh, a livable uh, community so you know you know where to find me my office uh, is in 1945 Broadway in Broadway Junction we are there, I have a staff helping every single day with all the needs the community has, whether it be helping finding affordable housing, whether it be dealing with uh, tenant harassment issues, whether it be the potholes, you know, all of the great things you depend on Camacho and Celeste on, we also do that as well, and we all, all try to work together to make that happen. I just have to say, I love Camacho's tie tonight, it's every Easter, I might borrow that for Sunday, so please pass it over. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're here to help, uh, uh, you know, I, ha I have my staff person, Lauren, is with me tonight. Um, you know, we, we send out uh, a monthly or tri-weekly uh, ease newsletters. If you want to join, please give us your email address so you can know what's happening on a daily basis in our office. And I'll make an effort to be back here uh, right by the time we pass the budget so we can give you more updates on what's happening. So great to see everyone. I'm here to help. Feel free to reach out. I'm humbly at your service. Thank you, guys. Okay, so any questions for the council member before we move on? Good evening, my name is Julie Dent and I run an early learn center here in Bushwick. Council member Espinar, I know you're very familiar with our program. What we've been hearing now uh -huh. with the um, 3K for all that's coming into our um, district, District 32 and it will be strictly under the Department of Education. Also, what's coming down the pipeline is the Department of Education will be the head sponsor of the Early Learn programs, which mean the um, child care programs, the Head Start programs, or, well, they were already over the um, Early Learn, which was pre-K for all. Our concern is we have been speaking to our council people as well as to the mayor's office, and we are looking for parity and salary for the teachers, and you know you have supported it for so many years with that initiative. However, we still are not getting anywhere with that. So um, I would like to know that if you could find out, do the legwork when you get back to um, your office and talk to the other council people, then let us know what they're going to do about that. Again, I must um, impress upon everyone that our teachers, the teachers in, some people call us daycare centers, we're early learn centers, a Head Start program. We have the same, my teachers have the same um, qualifications 
and the degrees as the teachers in the public school program. If we did not, then we would not be able to have the early learn programs in or pre-K for all programs in our centers. The difference is our teachers do not get paid the same, nor does the directors. The unions said they're working to try to bring this to light, as well as the um, city council. So right now, I'm reaching out to my city council person, Councilmember Espinel, since you're here. I also talked to Councilmember Reynoso. They represent Bushwick. This is District 32. This is the first year that we will, in September, that we will bring in the 3K for all. My center is one of the centers that will be um, offering 3K for all, but I want to know how are we going to get the parity in salary? Because our teachers are leaving, and I know I'm long-winded, but this is so important, because a lot of people know nothing about this. Our teachers are leaving our centers and going to the Department of Education and the, ch and the charter schools so they can make the salaries that the teachers are making. And I can't blame them for doing that. They have the same degrees, and so please tell me how you can help us with this. Thank you so much. So um, for those who don't, who, who don't know, 3K pretty much is pre-K for three-year-olds on, right? Uh, when the mayor announced um, uh, pre-K for all, it was for folks, uh, for, for children four years and older, decided to expand it three years now. And it's a great program because what, what I'm hearing actually from parents who, who are working parents, they're saving a lot of money because they no longer have to put their child in child care and pay out of pocket. Now, now the DOE is actually paying for the child care. They're able to uh, uh, save money, pay the rent, and do the things they need to do to continue living in the communities. Uh, but what Julie is talking about is that if you work for the Department of Education, if you're a teacher in a public school, you're making more money than the person in the early childhood care center. And that's something we've been fighting for for a very long time. We actually had a press conference this week on the same very issue. Uh, so I continue to stand by the campaign. And this is, you know, we're going through the budget cycle again. Right? There, we continue having enough voices. Hopefully we can push the mayor to make the right investments and making sure that everyone's getting paid the same for the same amount of work across the city. So I continue standing by that campaign. Uh, and before I give up the mic, I just want to add one more thing. I passed a bill recently uh, regarding uh, store awnings. And I don't know if you noticed, a lot of businesses who had to take down their awnings over uh, the past few months. And the, what was happening is the Department of Buildings was going around and finding every single business for their awnings because they didn't have the proper permits to have them up. But these are businesses who've had these awnings up for decades, 10, 20, 30 years. And now they're facing fines of 10, 20, $30,000. And the city really didn't want to do anything about it because of bureaucracy. I passed a bill, so if you know a store owner who's been affected by this, I passed a bill uh, pretty much reversing uh, all of those violations. Anyone who received a violation did not pay the fine does not have to pay the fine. Anyone who paid the fine already, unfortunately the city can't give you your money back, but they will give you a discount for the permits that you're gonna file to put your sign up. And there's a two year moratorium, meaning if you have a sign up and luckily you were not fined, you have two years to figure out how to get it up to code uh, without dealing with, with, the, with, the, with the bureaucracy of the DOB. Uh, so that, that just passed. If you know a local business owner, please let them know we have to preserve our small businesses. I'm also working on a bill right now uh, that will, uh, any, 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 any project that receives uh, your tax dollars uh, would require for some of the store frontage to be affordable so that mom and pops have the opportunity to get access to a, to a, a, a low cost commercial rent property. So if they, for some reason, do not, are not able to renew their lease because their rents continue to skyrocket, there would be an opportunity for them to go into a new building uh, with what's set aside for for the local uh, mom and pop shops as well. Uh, so we're working on a lot. I, I would love to hold the mic on for the next hour, but I'm not. Uh, and I hopefully when I come back next time, we'll continue updating on what I'm working on. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. How you doing, Councilman? As we all know, housing is our main issue here in Bushwick and um, citywide. We've been hearing um, conflicting info about the 500 million that the mayor dedicated to senior housing. Some of our coalitions here, just as with the churches, they're con concerned that the, mayor's, that the mayor's gonna renege on um, data money. Could you give us a firm update on that, whether the 500 million is allocated, whether it's pro projected, and um, Adam, you will be a partner with us to yeah. ensure that we hold the mayor uh, accountable for the 500 million. 
Yeah, so, so last year I joined uh, East Brooklyn Congregations on a, on a citywide campaign uh, to get the mayor to put in $500 million in the budget uh, to build senior housing. Uh, a lot of it here in Bushwick, especially a lot of the, the empty lots uh, near some of the next developments, and dedicate those those dedicate the money and those lots towards senior housing. The mayor, uh, at the la end of last year's budget process, committed to us and to the organization that $500 million was going to be put in the budget to build that housing. Uh, EBC recently found out that the money isn't there. And when we talked to the mayor, the mayor said, uh, the money is there, but it's not exactly how you think you'll find it in there. Whereas we have, we have $100 million here, we have this thing here, and there's really a lot of confusion. And we are continuing to push the mayor on this. Uh, where is the money? Because we did commit that we'll put $500 million every single year uh, to get this done. So it's an ongoing conversation, but I, I, we, we have to continue pushing and we have to continue working together uh, to, making to making sure that the money is exactly there for, for the housing. So I, I continue to stand with ABC. Is it a no? Is the money there? Or is yeah, the we, money we, don't know, we don't know yet. Like, just okay. like you, we're, we're we still prodding and trying to okay. figure, trigger, figure this out through the HPD and the other agencies in, involved. So uh, at the last CB4 meeting, the topic of the men's homeless shelter at 97 Wyckoff came up, and um, uh, just wondering why that particular building wasn't a consideration for senior housing. And um, and could you speak on that a little more? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't really speak to the building. It's not in my district. It's in Reynoso's district. Uh, I want to make sure that it's, it's across the street from my district. Yes. yes. I live in yeah. five long away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the best way to reach me is through my email address, R L E S P I N A L at council dot N Y C. You you might have I have an old one that doesn't have the L in it. It has uh it's just R and it's just R and E, but the new one's R L E. Um Yes, I, I have been. I've been noticing. My my office was not informed about the homeless shelter there. I found out through the community. People have reached out to me. Uh, so your neighbors have reached out to me. I have been in contact with them. Uh, the reality is, is that you know we're, we're facing a situation where we do have a homeless crisis. Uh, we do need to find places to put homeless shelters in. It's always contentious wherever we go. Uh, for example, half of your neighbors emailed me and said that they wanted to fight against the shelter from being there. The other half emailed me later and said, we changed our mind. We want to keep the homeless shelter there. We understand there's a problem. So, you know, we're, we're in a tough situation. How do, we, how do we work together to find a solution that works for everyone, but also works for the city of New York? You know, we do have a homeless, uh, homeless situation. Uh, should we be prioritizing low-income housing? 100%. I, don't, I believe we should stop building shelters. I believe we should stop building more low-income housing, get people permanent homes. It's the only way we're going to stabilize their lives. Um, and that's the conversation we should be having on, on a bigger front. Uh, but when it comes to this specific situation, we, we have to gather and we have to come up with a solution because the, the community, you know, there are folks who, 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 who believe it should be there. There's folks who don't believe it should be there. And we, we have to kind of work together to figure out what's the, what's the best way forward. has like one of the highest incidences of eviction in, in New York City. And one of the representatives, thank you, from the Department of Homeless Services said that they had over 800 individuals uh, whose last zip code was 11237 that are in need of housing. And I see a direct correlation between those two things. And I'm wondering um, if the city is, is, is not, is the city not, or is there not some aspect that the The city has done a lot over the past few years to making sure that everyone who is facing tenant harassment, anyone who's being evicted from their homes, has access to free legal representation to represent them in housing court and keep them in their apartments. Uh, unfortunately, as we know, the market is out of hand. People are being pushed out. A lot of all of the incidents are not, you know, all the situations are not the same. Um, at the end of the day, this is why the BCP plan is so important. We we have to look at how we're going to rezone Bushwick. Uh, 
to build the, the, the affordable housing that's needed, but also making sure they're preserving these properties so that the market doesn't continue being out of hand, people can stay in their homes. Uh, it's, it's a broader conversation, and, and it's, it's a real issue, but we should also be pushing for stronger rent laws in Albany. I'm not in Albany, but I'm advocating. Me personally, I believe we should have stronger rent protect protection so that people can't on loopholes and get people evicted out of their apartments. And that's happening before June. So I would say keep a close eye on that. Uh, call your local state, your state representatives. Tell them you want st stronger rent protections so people can have a better chance staying at their homes. I, I, I just wanna, I wanna thank you uh, for coming here and for also being in the front lines. But uh, I wanna be uh, the devil's advocate because I feel that Bushwick has it fair share of, of shelters, you know, enough is enough. You know, we have 11, how much more? You know, let's, let's be fair to all the other communities. Let's everybody else eat, not only us, because we have shelters here that have been here 20 and 30 years. Mind you, they're doing good, but sometimes we need to continue bringing them back home and give them somewhere to live. As you see now, District 32 in the schools, our kids are co commuting from shelters, from family shelters. So, you know, I, I don't mind. Any one of us can be homeless, but enough is enough is enough. We had our fair share, and we need to tell the mayor, listen, we got 11. You know, let's continue to keep our seniors here. My kids want to live here. Our kids want to continue to live here, afford to live here, and we want to make it better. If you're going to spend $700,000 or $33 million on 40 or 50 men, then that's something that we can uh, provide home and shelters for people to really live in homes. So we want, we love, any one of us can be homeless now. All we need is a fire, guys. All we need is to lose your job. We can be homeless. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying, we have 11. When we gonna say enough is enough? When we have 50 and 60 and we can't afford, and the transition that's going on is not very good. So we echo you, we understand you, and we hope uh, you stand with us in regards for us getting our fair share. I think uh, we had enough of homelessness. So yeah, I, I, I hear you, and again, this is why we have to push for real uh, affordable permanent, uh, low income affordable permanent housing. So no more, no more shelters, real housing uh, for those who are homeless. Yeah. I'm not in the state. I haven't looked at all 12 bills, so I, I, I can't really answer, answer that question, but I'll take a look. Yeah. All right, so we have to move on, and I do have a really quick announcement. So someone is blocking a car outside. The license plate is HTT1575. If that's your vehicle, please move your car. Someone is trying to leave, and they need the car to be moved first. Again, that's HTT1575. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we're going to thank our council member for being here with us this evening. And we're going to go ahead and move on to our second public hearing item, which is the New York City Department of City Planning. And they're presenting the North Brooklyn Industry and Innovation Plan. This is an informational presentation by the Senior Program Manager at the Department of City Planning. And this is, uh, go ahead. This is Carenza Wood, a uh, senior planner at the Department of City Planning, a plan that's been underway for uh, quite a while. Um, and um, give background for those of you who are not familiar or a reminder and add some uh, new details that we have. Um, so this is a plan that we launched um, uh, several years ago, really based on um, three overarching goals. Um, growing jobs closer to workers in neighborhoods that are growing, such as Bushwick, Updating M District zoning to ensure that industrial businesses have places to grow and expand. 
and creating new space for jobs such as advanced manufacturing, technology and media in really targeted locations closest to transit. Um, we launched this plan planning um, effort in 2015 and did a great deal of public outreach. We held three uh, public meetings, we spoke to over 50 businesses, um, and this all cum culminated in a report that we released in November um, that you can find online that really goes through everything we heard from businesses about their challenges to growing and staying um, in North Brooklyn um, and, and how we can better support them. Uh, this shows the study area, um, so it's the North Brooklyn Industrial Business Zone. Um, hopefully it's not too hard to see, but it, it, uh, the Newtown Creek is its eastern border and west of it are Greenpoint and Williamsburg and Bushwick is to the south. So it shares a southern border with um, the Bushwick Community Plan. Um, there, are, there are really only about 10 blocks of the study area that are in Community District 4 that fall below Flushing, south of Flushing Avenue. Um, and the rest are in Community District 1. Um, and it's just a really thriving, um, strate strategically important um, industrial area for New York City. Um, this is a land use map. Apologies if it's a little hard to see, but um, the purple really shows a sea of industrial uses farther from residential areas, farther from um, transit. And then to the south near the subway stops and closer to, to Bushwick, um, a more fine-grained mix of light manufacturing, commercial, retail entertainment um, uses. Um, and so we see this as a really great opportunity to um, grow jobs in an area that's close to neighborhoods like Bushwick, Greenpoint, and East Williamsburg. Um, it's a strategic location for in, um, industrial businesses that really want to be here, as, and we are also seeing emergence in some areas of more tech and media type businesses. And the city overall is just seeking opportunities to grow job centers outside Manhattan to en encourage reverse commutes and give people jobs, opportunities to work uh, closer to where they live, um, including Brooklynites um, bringing more jobs to Brooklyn. Um, this just shows the current employment um, conditions. There are um, almost 20,000 jobs in the study area, three quarters of which are industrial. Um, but what's notable is jobs are growing for the first time in decades. Um, for many years since 1969, jobs declined, but since 2010, jobs have actually grown, and that's been, been due to an increase in industrial jobs, particularly wholesale, construction, waste management, jobs that you know we kind of need for the city to function, as well as non-industrial jobs like more office-based um, and retail and entertainment jobs. Um, and of course, we're looking um, at the neighboring areas and taking a look at you know the the trends in Bushwick and and um, you know see that there's um, you know certainly diverse types of jobs that residents of Bushwick have. Twenty percent of those jobs are in, in industrial sectors. Um, and moving to the next slide, we also looked at where people work. Um, this this map on the left shows um, uh, where people in Bushwick commute to. So. There's a lot of people that work in finan the financial district in Midtown, which is just the case um, for the city as a whole, but also a lot in that white circle within North Brooklyn. Um, so how can we further leverage that? Um, and you know, we know that the average Bushwick resident um, travels for um, about 40 minutes commuting to work. So you know, really looking at this as an opportunity to create more walkable jobs and reduce commute times. Um, with all the growth, though, that's happening in jobs, we also know that the zoning is outdated and really limits the growth of jobs. It really limits, it, it dates back to 1961. Density is quite low. Um, uh, it requires very high parking and loading requirements that make it very difficult to build anything. Um, there are uh, height regulations that make it difficult to build those boxy, bulky, multi-story loft buildings where we see a lot of creative um, and light manufacturing uses in the area. And it also just gives a preference to community facilities like medical office over industrial and commercial uses and we really want to encourage them all. Um, so Carenza is going to go into more detail but this is the overarching framework and, uh, for, the, for the future development of the area. Uh, the purple is uh, two-thirds of the area, a core industrial area that would really be reinforced as essential for um, a place for essential industrial businesses. We would really want to retain that for them. Targeted areas in the pink closest to transit, 
um, where we'd really increase permitted density and reduce parking requirements to really allow for um, more, more significant growth and new construction of space for industrial and commercial jobs. And then the transition area where we put in an, into place, um, where we want to uh, encourage a kind of continued mix of uses and incentivize industrial while also encouraging commercial growth. And so as Sulin mentioned, we released the report in November of 2018, and that included the land use framework that we just saw. And so since then, um, DCP has been working on refining the land use framework and determining what a draft zoning framework would look like. Um, and it follows the, the land use framework um, that was shared. It has a core industrial area. It also has a core periphery area, which is between the heaviest industrial areas and the residential neighborhoods, as well as the growth district and the transition area. So in the core industrial area here, um, the zoning today is M3, which is our heaviest um, industrial districts. And so we would, um, we propose to maintain the M3 there, but do some modifications to really help businesses grow. Um, so today, uh, in M3 districts, um, no residential uses are allowed, no community facility uses are allowed, and that would remain the same. Um, there's two FAR um, allowed for uh, industrial and um, some commercial, limited commercial. And what we would change is that we wouldn't allow any new large-scale um, nightlife uses in this area to retain the area for industrial uses, um, as well as put a square footage limit on retail, um, entertainment bars, restaurants, as well as office space. Again, to really protect this area for um, industrial uses. Um, and in the darkest area, which is between Greenpoint Avenue and Lombardy Street, right by the BQE, we would allow additional FAR for um, industrial uses so they can expand. And then in a core periphery area, this is an area, as I mentioned, between the heaviest industrial areas and the residential neighborhoods of uh, Greenpoint East and East Williamsburg. Um, and our proposal here is to um, maintain uh, an M1 area with some modifications. And so today in these areas, um, again, no residential um, and all in most industrial uses except for the heaviest industrial uses, again, recognizing the proximity to residential uses, um, as well as certain community facility uses. And um, the FAR there today is both one and two FAR for industrial and commercial uses, but there's actually a preference more FAR for community facility uses, um, 2.4 or 4.8, which is over double the allowable use uh, FAR for industrial and com commercial. And so our proposal for this area is to reduce the community facility FAR so that community facility FAR, industrial and commercial are all the same, um, except that in the darker purple areas, there would be a bonus for industrial uses. Um, and then in terms of parking and loading, today, the, as Sulin mentioned, the parking requirements are quite high for industrial and commercial. So we would right size those to um, better reflect the existing sort of needs of existing businesses, um, as well as provide some flexibility in um, our pretty stringent loading requirements today. And then when a building is looking to expand, we would require less parking and loading um, so that if you're building a say additional story, you don't have to provide some of your more parking on the ground floor, which would impede business operations. And then moving to the growth district in which um, the community district four portion um, is within. Um, the goal here is to create, as Sula mentioned, a transit accessible neighborhood employment center near growing residential neighborhoods um, and to allow growth in diverse sectors, both industrial and um, different commercial uses. Um, and the underlying zoning today um, is M11 and M12. And uh, today, the zoning allows one FAR, two FAR, right on top of transit, you know, it's pretty, lo pretty low density. Um, it allows all industrial uses, except for the heaviest um, industrial uses, and most commercial uses, and then some limited community facility. Um, and our proposal for this area is to um, modify the zoning to allow for three FAR, four FAR, and five FAR districts, um, allow for the, and that would be allowed for um, the allowable uses, so industrial, commercial, and community facility. Um, and it's sort of hard to see on this map, but the, the, the densest five FER districts would be mapped along um, kind of transit corridors, both near the Morgan Avenue station, as well as um, the Jefferson Street station, so that's along Wyckoff in, in Bushwick. And then um, a, 
a more medium uh, 4FAR district was proposed for areas that are kind of just outside the transit corridor. And then 3FAR is proposed um, in areas that are close to residential uses, sort of recognizing um, the, the character there. Uh, in terms of parking, um, because of the transit accessibility um, and what we've heard from businesses, there wouldn't be any parking required for new development in this area, though certainly parking could be provided um, if that is uh, beneficial to the, the business. Um, and as well, there'd be some flexibility for loading. And then again, when a building is expanding, there wouldn't be a parking or loading requirement to better facilitate um, industrial businesses to uh, expand in place. And then in a transition area, as Dylan mentioned, the goal here is to um, acknowledge the existing character, which is a mix of industrial and commercial uses, um, and pr we propose two different uh, zoning districts here. So today, like the growth district, it allows both uh, um, industrial as well as commercial uses and some community facility uses. Um, and we would propose to, again, reduce the community fa facility FAR so that all uses are the same. Um, but we'd actually um, propose a, a increase in the industrial FAR here um, to double the amount for commercial to really incentivize a mix of industrial and commercial uses in areas that are you know, predominantly industrial. Um, and so in terms of um, next steps, as I mentioned, we're working on refining this proposal. Um, you know, we'll continue doing stakeholder engagement as we, as we work on this proposal. We have an email address and a website where you can find more information. Um, and certainly as we um, kind of look to our next steps, we would further engage with community forward for. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll open up for questions. Board members, any questions? <laughs> Hi, I'm Ann, a CB member, and I live right uh, near the Boar's Head factory. And I just looking at your map, I'm a little worried about that growth area. There are so many of major employers there right now, Boris Head being one of them. And uh, that I've watched over the last 20 years the incredibly rapid, increasingly rapid conversion of those industrial spaces into commercial bars, restaurants, stuff like that. So, what would you do about something like Boris Head, like the one ton place, the there's, I mean, there's a ton of stuff around there that looks like if it got upzoned, it would have a bullseye on its head in terms of a redevelopment <laughs> away from that. So, you know, we are doing outreach to existing businesses to better understand what their needs, needs are. We have heard from businesses um, like Wonton that zoning today prevents them from expanding in place. Um, and so we want to make sure that there's the ability to grow the office component as well as the industrial component on their site. Um, you know, they own their site, Boar's Head owns their site. And so we really view this as an opportunity for expansions in place. And these businesses are here for a reason. Um, we've heard that, you know, they need to be here. And so we hope that the zoning um, allows the flexibility for them to grow. making sure that they are able to stay in place. I know that Bogart had to go one way because the traffic was getting so bad their trucks couldn't even get up and down the street or turn the corner. So it, zoning alone is not going to keep them there. What else can you guys do to make sure that those, those businesses and those jobs stay? So as part of this planning effort, we'll also have um, Inter, inter different agency recommendations as well. We're working with closely with DOT, and so right now we're working on refining the zoning, but conversations with DOT and other agencies are also ongoing to address concerns like that. Other questions, comments from the public? Any board members? You spoke very fast, and I'm totally but what I'm hearing is that there are plans, or there are plans in the works for rezoning, and with that, uh, there are plans for additional or a change in commercial uses and industrial uses in the neighborhood. Um, I'm a resident, so I'm not quite sure your M3s and M1s. I, I'm not quite sure where that's lo being located, but how will that affect? 
Um, Cause I heard you say something about they, you won't require parking and like I can't find parking right now. And I have one car uh, and a whole house, and it, it's like I drive around for God knows how long just to find parking when I come home at night from work. So how do you think that will impact um, me finding a place to park in my neighborhood? So um, the areas where we're not pro proposing any parking are right by transit. And again, it's not a requirement, but businesses are cer certainly um, allowed uh, to provide parking. And you know, we, we've talked to businesses and a lot of businesses say that we need parking for our employees, we need parking for our customers, and certainly you know, will provide if it's part of their business operations. Uh, and in then areas farther from transit, parking certainly would still be required. Again, if there's a need for parking, you know, businesses may provide that in their development. Yeah, I mean, w the way we think about parking requirements is that if, if we're removing them, it's kind of letting the market decide, right? So when we remove them, we're not expecting businesses not to provide parking because we know a lot of these businesses do need some for their, for their employees and for their customers. Oh, no, no, we're not, we're not taking away any parking. It's in the case of a new development. Currently the, the zoning requires a great deal of parking to the point where new space for jobs can't even be built. Basically under the existing zoning you have to f um, fill your entire ground floor with parking which means no, nobody's going to create new space for jobs and no, nobody's building anything and so the idea is loosening that, letting um, businesses decide how much they need but that wouldn't impact you know, the, the supply of on-street parking in any way. If there are any other comments, now is the time to do so. Otherwise, we're going to, is there a hand in the back? still be required um, so that's just one thing I wanted to, to note there but I understand your concern and you know we'll definitely think about that okay thank you for coming oh wait Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kevin. I'm a Bushwick resident. I work at Brooklyn A. We provide um, housing and legal services. I have a question regarding the current uh, law about uh, the conversion of lofts in this very specific area. Uh, it reopens the possibility to convert uh, existing manufacturing to lofts, um, to legalize existing lofts. And I'm wondering how the Department of City Planning is factoring in uh, this uh, legislation knowing that could really open the floodgates to a lot of residential in areas that are protected in the IBZ. So the, the North Brooklyn plan is a long-term planning effort for the entire industrial business zone. Um, you know, we recognize that, you know, there are loft buildings in the growth district in particular that are open to this, but again, this is like a long-term planning effort looking at, um, you know, how to, uh, um, you know, think about different sub areas over time. And so it's not necessarily about the specific buildings, but a long-term vision for the area. Last question. Is that better? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah don't press Closer? Button. Okay. Sorry. Not going to go through the intro again. So, uh, hearing from what you proposed, um, 
I'm a little concerned both on uh, the way the core, the core periphery, the growth, growth district and the transition area is set up, um, particularly in the growth district, which you've highlighted, um, well, Kevin highlighted, are where uh, the proposed loft uh, built um, allows for conversion of manufacturing spaces to these weird residential set setups. Um, there seems to be both a misalignment between the mayor's support for the loft bill and the intentions on the face value of this IBZ plan, because supposedly this IBZ plan is trying to protect manufacturing in some sense. Um, that seems to run contrary to what the mayor is doing by supporting a loft bill. Um, and that seems like, to me, like a, like a local organizer, like the higher ups of the city aren't coordinated or are speaking two sides of their mouth, which is very scary when, you, when we're dealing with issues like this. Specifically to this plan though, I would say, um, seems in the areas like the growth district and transition area that are trying to promote more commercial uses the way you were saying when we're, I think from Bushwick, we're very much set on protecting the manufacturing as it is or increasing it. Um, I heard the word office uses come a couple times out of your presentation, which really alarms me. Um, I think if you line that up, um, promoting office uses with a loft bill conversion proposal, this kind of just starts to read like really planned, polite displacement. Because if you know anything about what's happened here in North Brooklyn, specifically in Bushwick, losing a manufacturing job, there's no affordable housing without a job. Um, allowing for commercial uses, allowing for towers, the way that presents, the way it looks, um, the secondary displacement pressures that come on the area, it seems like, A, to my point, this doesn't align with what the mayor's saying by supporting the law flaw bill, and then B, it doesn't seem like even this plan really lines up with the priorities of Bushwick. So I was hoping for some feedback on that, so I'm not an expert, but from my lived experience and my organizing, this doesn't seem like it's working. Um, so we, we see this as a really pro-industrial and manufacturing plan. Two-thirds of the study area are a core industrial area where we're putting limitations on other types of uses that are competing for industrial uses um, for space. Um, uh, commercial uses are allowed today. There's, um, as you know, conversions of existing space happening absent the city doing anything. And so the idea is really channeling that development pressure to really targeted areas closest to transit in the growth district where we'd be increasing FER for industrial and commercial, but um, channeling that way away from the core industrial area um, where which we're really reinforcing for industrial uses. And then the transition area is where we're really still being the scale toward industrial by providing an incentive for industrial. Um, so the growth district is about you know 15%, 13%, I think, of, of the study as a whole, and we see that as actually a very pro industrial proposal. Okay, so thank you everyone. We're gonna we're gonna close out this item now. And we thank this Department of City Planning for coming this evening and presenting. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay, so before we do our regular meeting agenda, I do want to acknowledge I was informed that we have uh, two guests with us this evening. We have both Edward King and uh, Miss Meredith Jones. If they would like to take an opportunity to introduce themselves and say a few words to those in attendance. 1.5 seconds, please. Minister. 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 Minister.
Um, I've been at the court a long time. I just wanted to specify that the election really about me, but I needed to tell you a little bit about my resume um, so that you know who, who I'm asking you to come out for. Um, but it's, I've been at the court, I've worked at the court, and um, I just wanted to say that the court has fallen short in some instances and give you one example of that and, and kind of urge you to vote and get out of your hair. Um, there's an office called the Public Administrator's Office. That's an office that's responsible for um, handling those estates of people with enough relatives to handle their estates and administer their estates. And where appointed, the public administrator is charged with collecting those assets, guarding those assets, and distributing those assets to whoever the heirs are in the state. And the surrogate court judge is responsible for supervising that office, so it's kind of a part of the court as well. And so because that office hasn't run well, they haven't balanced their book, ha properly balanced their books, um, like you and I have to do, reconcile their records, and because they have not, um, they failed to keep proper records of monies coming in, monies have been stolen from that office. And so I want to stop this from happening. And so that's, I believe that the surrogate court is too important of a court not to be running correctly. So if elected, I want to make sure that the surrogate's court meets its mandate to serve the people of Brooklyn. And so I just want to make sure, I just want to urge you also one other point before I go, is to urge you to come out to vote. Um, voting is very important. One of the things that I hear is people only want to vote for president or governor, but um, I just want to urge you that these local elections are some of the most important election. I think even more important sometimes in the federal elections because these people um, that are elected institute practices and policies that directly affect your lives. So I want to urge you to come out and vote. Meredith Jones, bring 10 friends and family members and cousins, et cetera. Um, Meredith Jones, running for judge of the surrogates court of Kings County. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, to Camacho, Ms. Leon, to the uh, community board 14, to uh, the oh, ladies oh. board, for, excuse me, for, four to the um, Ladies and gentlemen here in the audience, and, and I consider you all my brothers and sisters, and I apologize. I've been running around to too many community boards. My name is Edward King, and I'm running for the Civil Court of the City of New York, and it's countywide. That's why I said I've been running around all of the county. Um, I'm running for the Civil Court as a judge for the Civil Court of the City of New York. Now, the Civil Court is a court that handles claims of uh, $25,000 or less, landlord tenant issues, and small claims, besides uh, name changes. Why this is important. And, you, and it may not seem like it's important, but it's very important is because the civil court is a court where most of the people that go there don't have lawyers. That means that and most of the people that go to civil court fit three categories. One, they're unrepresented. Two, that they're mostly female. And three, is that a number of the people that go to the civil court are minorities. And that means that when, you don't, when you're unrepresented, you have approximately, I mean, uh, approximately 30 seconds in the civil court to present your claim or defense in any part of that court. Now, you need someone there that can, because of the time factor, because of the, some of the attitudes that are there, you need someone there who the sensitivity, the knowledge, the experience, and the maturity to listen to your claim, to hopefully give you a fair shot, and to give you a, a just result. Now, in terms of my, who I am, um, I've been an attorney for almost 35 years. I'm a military veteran. Um, I'm, a, I'm a family man. I'm also a deacon. I'm also almost a lifelong resident of Bedford Stuyvesant. So, the reason I wanted to bring this to you is because you have to have that sensitivity. Because when you walk up there to that court, and if you don't have your quote unquote stuff together, you're going to be sitting down there and no one will listen to you, and you'll probably lose because usually the other side has an attorney there. The other thing I wanted to tell you is that about me is that I'm very much concerned about the people in places like Bedford Stuyvesant, East New York, Flatbush, all the different places of people that I've represented over the years. The other thing I wanted to tell you is that I'm also very concerned about after my uh, leak at this is certain things that are happening in our communities, including third party program. I'm, I'm, I'm a member of a group that advocates against that program, the city has entered it for years, and also uh, landlord and tenant issues, as well as senior city issues, because I believe the cities are, are, are under attack. So um, today I, I discussed something I want to bring it to your attention. Right now, the, this has nothing to do with this necessarily with the civil court, but it has something to do with the Supreme Court. I want you to please pay attention. Right now, they have been instituted a program where you can't do the normal appeals process anymore in the appellate division of the, of the second department where you make appeals. That means you have to follow a program where you have to digitize or uh, make in a, a PDF form your appeal. This includes you doing things like putting um, hyperlinks and bookmarks to your, to your appeals process. What this means is, is that for the person here, you won't be able, something goes bad for you, and you want to appeal it, 
you won't be able because it'll become too expensive. I had another colleague of mine talk to me today. They had a six-page brief, and it was a pretty novel issue. It cost them $800 to file that appeal, $800. That means that for the average person, you won't be able to really deal with that situation. So I want you to know that there are people that are concerned what goes on with the folks here in, in Bushwick and these other places, are those people. My name is Edward King. I'm running for the Civil Court of the City of New York. The election is June 25th, not September, because they changed the primary date from September to June for the whole city. So please uh, remember that. Come out on June 25th. I apologize for calling this 14. I'm going to 18 now. But, um, but I wanted you to please know that. Thank you for listening, and thank you for giving me the time to present myself. Okay, so now we'll move along to our regular meeting agenda. At this time, I will ask for our board members to quietly get up and get themselves some dinner. Board members only first, then if the crowd or whoever wants to go next. Please, only board members. And if you haven't signed in, please sign in first, board members. Have all board members signed in? Board members, have you signed in?
Okay, everyone, for the sake of time, we have to move forward with the meeting. So I ask for you to quietly go back to your seats and let everyone get their dinner this evening. We're going to move forward with the first roll call. Board members, first roll call. Grace. Joanna Bennett is excused. L.A. Blythe. Joshua Brown. Martha Brown is excused. Robert Kamal. One meeting, please. One meeting. Fia Ceballos. Gardy Caphart, Melissa Curra, Louisa Chen, Sufia Chowdhury, Elvina Davis, Jude Dent, Carlos Feliciano, Victoria Fernandez, Freddie Fowler, Igaudi Gomez, Christopher Graham, Ann Guiney, Jose Guzman is excused, Michelle Hilliard, Barbara Jackson, Cheryl Jones, Virgie Jones is excused, Nancy Liao, Austin Martinez, Mary McClellan, Desmond Monroe, Charlene Moore, Zuma Novoa is excused, Cirilo Nunez, Luisa Jose Olea, Asire Polite, Gladys Puglia is excused, Raul Rubio, Eliseo Ruiz, Julio Salinas, John Schieffer, Bernadine Urschel, Barbara Smith, Dustin Sonborn, Annette Spellin, Jerry Valentin, James Wiseman, Old Off Wright. We have 32 board members present. That constitutes a quorum. Thank you, everyone. And so before we move forward with our regular meeting, I do want to acknowledge that we have our senator with us this evening, Senator Julia Salazar. Let's give her a warm welcome. And we'll give her a chance to speak now. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. Uh, the last time that I was able to personally make it to a CB4 meeting was uh, right before our inauguration in January um, because the Senate has been in session. So I'm really happy that uh, we, have a, we have a quick recess for the next couple of weeks um, that allows me to be here with you. Um, I want to give some quick updates on the state budget process that we just came out of. One of the most important um, changes that came from the state budget is that we finally passed comprehensive bail reform, um, discovery reform, and speedy trial reform in New York. Um, it's going to affect 90% of the cases that currently um, are eligible for, for money bail in New York are, are no longer uh, going to be um, considered for for cash bail, um, which is going to make a, a huge difference, particularly for people in our communities um, and for low-income New Yorkers um, who who have been detained based on what they can afford to pay, um, rather than than um, than based on justice. So that's a that's a huge development. Um, there are. A lot of things that that I could mention, um, but we're actually going to have a town hall next um, <laughs> next Tuesday evening, April twenty third, uh, to to fully debrief the budget process, update everyone, um, and be able to answer uh, more questions and take more time. Um, there's more information in the back about that. Uh, but we did, we secured a $1 billion increase in school aid in New York State, um, as well as a substantial increase in foundation aid, which is really important, particularly for, for our schools that have been uh, inequitably funded across the state and um, in, in Bushwick and in the 18th Senate District. Um, we also increased um, the state's investment in safety net hospitals, uh, which is really crucial. Um, in ISEP, or the, the expanded in-home service for the elderly, um, making sure that, that our seniors have access to the care that they need as well. Um, 
as far as our office, um, three bills that I was lead sponsor of have, have already passed in this session um, through the Senate and the Assembly, including called the Comprehensive Contraception Act, which is um, going to ensure that many people who previously didn't have access, uh, crucial to contraception services in, um, in New York will, will be able to now. Um, we are now shifting our focus to the rent laws fight. I want to thank um, Community 4 for supporting uh, the, the Housing Justice for All, State Down State Coalition's um, platform of, of nine different bills that will uh, seek to, to expand tenant protections and make sure that more people um, who've and families who've been in, in their homes for decades will be able to stay in their homes, protect more people from displacement and from eviction. Um, one, of, one of those bills in the plan is bill that I introduced related to good cause eviction, um, seeking to ensure that tenants across the state who are currently excluded from rent regulation and, and actually no protections as tenants will uh, be guaranteed the right to a release um, uh, as, as long as there isn't good cause um, shown to, to evict the tenant. Um, so that would be huge. Uh, it would have a, a tremendous impact on the lives of, of millions of tents in the state. Um, that's that's it for now. Uh, a reminder, next Tuesday night is our town hall. I would love to see all of you there. Thank you. Are there questions for Senator before we move on? Our district office. Um, <laughs> so... That's been really challenging <laughs> as a brand new senator. Um, we don't have a permanent break off right now. Um, we are about to move into a temporary space in South Williams. Um, we can get you uh, more information about that, the exact address. Um, and I'll ensure that you have at least the, the phone number to contact our district office, um, several of my staff here. Um, in the meantime, we will be using um, state space at 250 Bray in Manhattan. I find it disheartening that uh, we don't have a office in Bushwick, so we're going to fight. We're going to fight with you to get an office in Bushwick because we need to have close by. We don't need to have you in 250 Manhattan. We don't, we, we don't live in Manhattan. We live in Bushwick, so it's hard enough to get the train over there. I might even taking a car walking over there, so we need you here. We want to make sure that Boris, you find something over here. We might have something over there on Bushwick Avenue that uh, have closed down for about two, three years, and these developers are not uh, renting out to people like me, so you got to make sure we get them people in there and get, move us in there. Uh, it's not uh, good that uh, we don't have our senator here, and uh, we got to push for that. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for joining us, Senator Salazar. And moving on now, we've finished the first roll call. We're going to move on to the acceptance of the agenda. Is there a motion from the board to accept the meeting's agenda for today? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. Thank you. Agenda item number three, acceptance of the previous meeting minutes. Is there a motion from the board? Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. And moving on down now to agenda item number four. That's our chairperson's report, Mr. Camacho. Uh, thank you. Well, I was working hard March, uh, Friday, March 22nd. I had a staff meeting in CB4 in regards to uh, our staff. Uh, on uh, March uh, 23rd, I went to 101 Wyckoff. It was Saturday at 2 p.m. in regards to the residents, uh, the shelter on uh, 97 Wyckoff. Uh, we met with them, and uh, we're trying to make sure that uh, Whatever's in there, they have our people in there if they're going to put a shelter. Uh, make sure that it's less than the numbers that they say. Uh, we're trying to work with the tenants over there to make sure. So on uh, 26, at 10 a.m., I went to 260 Bray for the Brooklyn Task Force. They're going to have a task force uh, guard to all city agencies. On Wednesday, March 27th, I went to uh, Highland and Trick with DOT. They want to with less. Uh, it was supposed to be part of C3, uh, but they never came, so we became part of there. Yeah, when Highland Boulevard turns into Bushwick, all that traffic that's there before you turn, they want to try to fix the light. The people can't cross there. It's crazy. So we stood there for about an hour or two and watching people running across 
uh, over there. So they want to try to do a survey in regard to there. That same day at 3.30, I went to Buena Vida, had some sort of forum over there in Buena Vida. On uh, March 29th, Friday, 11, I went to uh, the camp meeting at NICA, NICA, which is the shelter on Cal. There is an advisory board there. They're very good. Anybody that have any problems with that, call the community board. They ha we have no problems. They take care of the issues very well. Uh, I also, that same day, I, I went to at 6 o'clock for 97 Wyckoff. They were giving leaflets and letting the community know what was going on in that building. That same day, I went to 3 to 6.30. I went to uh, the NBA, which is the Neighborhood Advisory Board at 55 Goodwin Place. Uh, some of the service that uh, DYC made sure that some of the money that's supposed to be a, a survey coming out. We want more, uh, some of you, some jobs and programs for non-for-profits, for daycares. We wanted to get some more money and funding and grants. Um, on March, on April 1st, at 4 p.m., I went to 2, uh, two Kitchen Avenue in Maspeth, which is the Edgar Exchange. I met with Ann Guiney and some of the people there in regards to jobs and making sure that uh, the C uh, the, the what is it, the BCP, the Buddhity Plan, uh, in regards to no M to R for jobs and manufactured jobs. Not everybody can be a rocket scientist. So, you know, we need also skilled trades, plumbers, electrician. You know, that's $45 an hour. I wish I could, you know, so everybody ain't going to be a computer and sitting down in an office with a tie like mine. But um, <laughs> on April, on Tuesday the 2nd, I went to the Brooklyn Borough President meeting at 6 p.m. On Wednesday, I went to the executive board meeting. On April 4, at 1 p.m., I was in a meeting with Assemblywoman Marissa Davila in regards to the shelter. On Thursday, April 11th, uh, I went to the Civil and Religious. It has 100 names together, but they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I was there. On Friday at 12, we met again with uh, the 12th with Marissa Davila in regards to some of the tenants in 97, so there's a big issue with that. On April 16th, I went to the Bushwick Community Partners at 422 Central with uh, Celeste. We were there. On April 16th at 6.30, I went to the 83 Precinct Council. Yeah, hey, yeah. Where's, where's, where's the Dooley? Dooley, you there? Holla, there you go. Uh, <laughs> today, I'm, oh, I also went today at 10 o'clock in the morning to the Clergy Council. We got we to gotta help our clergies too. You know, we also need a little love and God in our heart. So you got to come over to the clergy council too and let those people know that they're, that they're part of our community. Guess what? They live here. They pray for us. And you should be the wonderful job uh, the board does there with Mr. Uh, Bishop Clark or uh, uh, Mrs. Davis, Avina Davis. You have the most wonderful people there. They try to cut me off all the time because they only want to talk about they only want to talk about Jesus and everything, but I tell them, I need some Jesus in my life, so don't worry about it. So, uh, and today I'm here. Thank you. I've been working hard for these boards, and I never thought it would be this hard, but I love you guys, and woo, thank you. Moving. Like Biggie say, if you don't know, now you know. Moving on with our meeting agenda, this is now an opportunity for our elected officials and representatives to introduce themselves. If there's anyone here, uh, name and office information, you can line up now. Elected official representatives. Good evening, I bring you greetings on behalf of Assemblyman Eric Delarn. Our office is 366 Cornelia Street the corner of uh, Canadians and Irvin. The telephone number is 718-386-4576. Again, it's 718-386-4576. Have a good evening and happy holidays. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Asher Freeman. I'm the Office of Council Member Reynoso. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip the update and just speak to the presentation that was given by the Department of City Planning earlier. Uh, our address is 244 Unanu. Uh, the telephone number is 718-963-3141. And that's it. Thanks. And that is our parliamentary show. Good evening, Community Board 4. Hey, good evening. 
My name is Nan Blackshear. I am Community Affairs Director for Brooklyn Borough President Eric L. Adams, filling in for my colleague Marcus Harris. Our office is located downtown Brooklyn. It is at 209 Geralaman Street, across the street from the Municipal Building, in case you that better than our building. And um, you can reach myself at 718-802-3863, or my colleague, who is the normal liaison, at 718-802-3909. Announcements are later? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good evening and a great holiday. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Pomboza. I bring greetings from District Attorney Eric Gonzalez. Our office is located at 350 J Street, and our number is 718-250-2817. And you could also learn more about Justice 2020 at brooklynda.org. Thank you. Good evening, CB4. Julio Salazar, Congresswoman Edia Velasquez's office. We're located at 266 Broadway, phone number 718-599-365. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lorenzo Brea. I'm a representative of Council Member Espinal. We're located at 1945 Broadway. Our phone number is 718-642-8664. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. And moving along, if there are any agency or community-based organizations that would also like to introduce themselves and provide info, now is the time to do so. City agency, state agency, any agency or community-based organizations? Hey everybody, um, I'm Lindsay. I'm the director of uh, Hope Gardens Community Center, Coalition for Hispanic Family Services. Um, we're located at 422 Central Avenue, uh, right around the corner from here. You can reach us at 718-919-1020. Uh, we do have all of our summer camp uh, applications out right now, elementary and middle school, and we're helping youth with um, SYEP applications. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Lily Chang from Bushwick Food Cooperative. We're at 2 Porter Ave near Flushing, and the phone number to contact is 347 450 1087. Good evening, my name is Mercedes and I work for North Brooklyn Coalition. Um, we are a, a organization that works with domestic violence and sexual assault survivors. And uh, next week we will be having our annual um, rally against sexual assault, which would be held. Just contact information only, announcements are later. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, so our organization is in the Bushwick area. Um, mm -hmm. Our address is confidential, but you, uh, you can call us at 718-302-4073. Sorry about that. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Kayleen Troche. I'm an account manager for Elite Home Care Agency. We are located at 1967 McDowell Avenue. We're all over five, um, all over the five boroughs. And you can contact me at 917-426-3471. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gloria Telestovar. I'm with the Community Education Council in District 32. I'm currently the VP. Our telephone number to contact us in regards to the public schools here in Bushwick is 718-574-1203. And our address is 797 Bushwick Avenue, room 319. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Joel Rubio. I am uh, representing the Department of Health. I am one of the coordinators that organizes mental health first aid, so if anybody's looking for uh, first aid training, my number is 917-250-916, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And moving forward with the agenda, we're now gonna welcome our 80th Precinct Commanding Officer, Deputy Inspector Dan Dooley. Thank you, everybody. Uh, once again, I was told, oh, you don't have to say anything, just come hang out. And once again, <laughs> someone here, I'm at the microphone again. So uh, listen, uh, 
We are in the middle of April. Uh, the 83rd Precinct has led the city in crime region for the last three months. Uh, and I, I, I owe it all to, to you. Uh, we had a couple of incidents that we were seeing in the news. Um, those are anomalies to going on in this precinct right now. Uh, we're doing extremely well. Uh, I don't want to jinx it. Uh, the, I know the warm weather's coming, but we're ready. We're prepared. Um, our NCOs are doing awesome. Our community affairs are doing awesome. We have a lot of great community events going along. Uh, the community council meeting was there last night. How much fun. Uh, it's, it's all starting to come together, and it's only getting better. So uh, I'll be here. I might, I've opened the policy, so anytime anyone wants to come down to the 83rd Precinct, show you around. We'll show you what's going on over in the 83, uh, but we're doing very well. Okay, so thank you. Enjoy. No oh, questions? Uh, questions. So I got good. I guess I got bad news and good news. So I lost my executive officer. For everyone knows, uh, Captain Hugo Dominguez. Uh, he, he's really awesome. Uh, I lost him for a good reason. Uh, they moved him over to the 73rd precinct over in Brownsville. So, um, they like to get our executive, <laughs> they like to get our executive officers uh, involved with other precincts to um, basically get mentored by other commanders. That way, when he gets his own command one day, he'll have a good uh, wealth of knowledge all, all around. So that's a good thing for him. It's sad that, he, that he's gone. He, he's such a I've been such an integral part of the 8th precinct. But I was lucky enough to get a new executive officer, Captain Stevens Peraza. Uh, he couldn't make it here tonight. He had to do a day duty today. He's got a search warrant tomorrow morning. Uh, but he's uh, came actually coincidence, right? He came from the 73rd precinct. So I got one from the 7th, I had to give one to the 7th three. So hopefully he's going to work well. We'll make sure we get him to one of these meetings. Uh, again, if you come down to the 83rd precinct, you can sit down with either of us and uh, we'll show you around. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. okay Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving along with our agenda now to agenda item number five, which is the district manager's report. That's my report. Uh, keep it brief. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone has been able to take advantage of weather and volunteer opportunities across the neighborhood. Over the next couple of months, CB4 has exciting events and opportunities for community participation, including but not limited to our annual parade and Shape Up Bushwick event, which you will hear more about during committee reports. Additionally, as some of you may know, the Department of City Planning is scheduled to present a Bushwick Neighborhood Plan update next Tuesday, April 23rd at 6 p.m. in the Board's Office Building at 1420 Bushwick Avenue. Over the past five years, there's been a great deal of work and conversation about this plan, and it remains crucial for everyone, all of Bushwick, to be involved. It is important to note that the city's, that City Planning's Bushwick Neighborhood Plan is not the Bushwick Community Plan that the board symbolically voted to support this past January. It is also important for me to note that as district manager of the board, I do not vote on anything that comes before the board. I am here for the board and Bushwick, and Mr. Camacho is my boss. I remain honored to serve all of Bushwick and look forward to advocating for our greatest needs in solidarity. Below are the meetings and events I've attended along with other relevant information that you may find helpful. And Mr. Camacho and I have attended many of these meetings together, so I won't go through them all. However, I will reference a few that I think are important. And that being said, on Tuesday, March 26, 2019, I attended the USES Customer Advisory Council meeting. I joined my fellow district manager and other community leaders to discuss the chronic postal service issues with the postmaster himself. That's Mr. Eddie Banner. Mr. Banner shared the steps he's taken thus far, including changes to post office management and personnel expectations. We also requested organizing a Customer Appreciation Day event at the Gates Avenue Post Office. More information will be made available in the near future. And I do want to comment on the, on Wednesday, March 26th, Mr. Camacho and I were at the North Brooklyn Health and Wellness Roundtable. I want to reference this as health issues are one of the top five issues in the neighborhood. We joined community health leaders and stakeholders for a timely discussion on health statistics in, in Bushwick at Buena Vida, uh, Continuing Care and Rehab Center, health issues such as chronic conditions, including but not limited asthma, high blood pressure and obesity, access to fresh affordable food, and access to insurance and quality medical care were discussed. The round, the round continues to meet monthly and aims to bring service providers and leaders together to find solutions to health issues. I encourage anyone interested in getting more involved to reach out Danielle Cohn, the marketing director at Bovida. And on Tuesday, April 9th, I attended the Borough Service Cabinet meeting. Along with my fellow district managers at Borough, we listened to presentations from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, and Department of Design Construction, as well as NY311. Both DP and DDC provided information on underground water main work throughout the borough and that they intend to come to Bushwick next in the vicinity around PS183. 
I raised concerns about advance and proper notice to which they assured specific protocols for schools. NYC311 provided an overview of the changes to their software. And on Wednesday, April 10th, Mr. Camacho and I were at our district service cabinet with liaisons from the Department of Environmental Protection, Emergency Management, Department for the National Grid, Councilmember Rosso's office, the Mayor's 10 Support Unit, Public Engagement, Councilmember Espinal's office, Department of Transportation, Con Edison, NY, NYPD, Parks and Recreation, the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs, and DNY. Now, I read all of those for a reason, and that's because I want Bushwick to know that these are the agents that come out for Bushwick. These are the agencies that are here listening to the concerns. Any that you tell the community board, we tell those agencies directly. And their presence is crucial, especially at a time like this when so much is changing and so much is going on. And so we had a presentation that day, the tenant support unit, they provided an overview of their work Bushwick, and all agencies in attendance were able to share updates and respond to questions and complaints. And I have to say, since I started working at the board, that meeting in itself, the district service cat is designed to help agencies speak to one another and resolve issues. And we had both NYPD and the Parks Department that were able to resolve opening and closing Mar Maria Hernandez Park in, in one exchange, as opposed to having to deal with, with phone calls and communication. At one meeting, they were able to say, here's these, we're on the same page. And that's what that meeting is about. So if you have any questions about the Drug Service Cabinet, please do not hesitate to ask me. As she, I just wanted to interrupt, I'm sorry. As she's speaking, uh, one, one key uh, person wasn't there was the department. And we, we, I echoed her that we need to write to the, that they need to come. We have a lot of issues in regards to uh, buildings, departments, and permits, and parking, and this and that. And we had a lot of calls. They wasn't the answer. So hopefully we're going to have just a meeting with them. And uh, we'll invite all of you to make sure that all your concerns are answered. Okay, and lastly, I will comment on Tuesday, April 16th, yesterday, at the Twitter Community Partnership Program meeting. Uh, Mr. Camacho and I joined community survivors for an informative data presentation. This was facilitated by the NYC Center for Innovation through Data Intelligence. Their report focused on key neighborhood issues such as health and education, economic assets, etc. Those in attendance were able to provide feedback on their statistical data and resource maps. And so right now, data is so important because when we're asking for funds for Bushwick, when we, we want to make sure that those that have most need get what they need, it comes down to that data, and it comes down to making sure that we have a record of it. And so we were, we were very pleased to see that they completed this report in partnership with ACS and the larger Bushwick community. And attached to my report, there are also flyers. I won't go through them because I know that uh, we have announcements coming up at the end, but I encourage everyone who hasn't picked up a copy of my report, there are extras up front here. Please take a look at all the flyers upcoming events, both board events and community events, as well as other information. And that concludes our report. Thank you. <laughs> Moving along now to committee reports, agenda item number six, and we'll start with our public safety committee, chairperson Barbara Smith. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, I had two of our applicants come out. I just received a letter concerning one of the applicants, so I haven't had a chance to discuss this with our community board for manager or chairperson, so I'm not going to report on this site until we discuss this. Mm -hmm. And of the other one, 65 Irvin, is still under construction, so I advise this gentleman to reach out to his neighbors because they are already concerned that he's opening. And I think the problem is people are being bombarded with these bars and restaurants, so he hasn't even disturbed anybody yet and they're already complaining, <laughs> which is not fair to him. You know what I mean? So my committee advised him to go back, take his neighbors out to lunch at another bar or restaurant. Get to know your neighbors, because if this is going to be your livelihood, if they're already complaining, what are they going to do when he does open his doors to have people coming and utilizing his site? So we're putting him on hold until he reach out to his next door neighbors, the people around him, to get a good rapport with him and what he's trying to do, and then he's going to come back to us later. So, like I said, I had another applicant, but for now, I'm going to put that one on hold until I discuss this matter with community board for manager and chairperson. Thank you.
And moving on to our civic and religious and also our health committee, they're going to talk a little bit about Shape Up Bushwick. Good evening, everyone. Our report is kind of lengthy, so I'm not going to read this report. I asked you to read the report yourself, but I am going to touch base, touch a few things on, on this report. The Civic and Religious Committee and the Health, Hospital, Human Services, and Citizens Veterans met jointly on Thursday, April 11th, um, 2019, 3 p.m. at the Community Board Office, 1420 Bushwick Avenue, um, Suite 370. Um, we had a lot of attendees for this meeting. We had our first meeting agenda item, which was Mr. Joshua Brown, our Mr. Joshua Brown, yeah. and Pastor Cornelius Brown, which they presented to the committee um, on a petition to establish a Family First Friday, a family summertime holiday to celebrate the gift of family on the first Friday of August. They are asking for a letter of support for this proposed national holiday to celebrate the gifts of family. The goal of this holiday is to stimulate healing among families as well as to promote moral and mental health. They will be presenting to the full board in May, and then there will be a proposal put to the board to decide if we will give a letter of support or not for this venture. Um, then we, our main thing we talked about was, of course, our parade. Yay. We're back again. <laughs> We're back again. Um, again, our parade, the annual parade, annual parade, and Shape Up Bushwick will be on Thursday, June 6, 2019, between 10 and 3 p.m. There are flyers that are available. We have proposed our honorees to be saying as our grand marshal, we're opposing Miss Julian and Miss Nadine Whitted. <laughs> Since they did such a great job for us for so many years, I feel that they are well past due in honoring. So they will be our honoree and grand marshal both. Um, let's see. Please read all the, I, um, the things that we touch base on, but I'm going to mention the things that we still need for the parade and for the event. These are very important. There are some things that um, we're still lacking, and we'll hope the community will help us. Again, we need bicycles, and we are asking again for brand new donate bikes with helmets so that we can wrap, of course, for free to children that participate. We're also looking for a donation of ice, tables and chairs, uh, fitness instructors. If anyone knows of any fitness instructors that would like to volunteer and um, give classes in the park as usual. We're looking for instructors. Uh, we're also looking for porta, porta parties. Um, normally, our former senator, one that donated, we're looking at our new senator. Hey. <laughs> uh, where's the Boris? That is, that is a need we, we need. Um, we had on the floor that we needed um, somebody who would represent um, with the food and protection and um, the Health and Hospitals um, um, Board of Health. I went in, on and took care of that. I took the course, passed it. Yay! Yay. I have a, 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 so covered with that means that forceful aid, we will be covered in case there's any issue. So that's taken care of. Um, we are also asking for volunteers for that day. We need volunteers to help us to set up. We need volunteers to help us down and get out of the park. So anyone who's interested in volunteering, the young people who are off that day that will come and help us, please, please, we need them. Also, we're asking our community residents to pass out the flyers on their block. Stop at your schools. There's a business that we will have to support the businesses. If there's any businesses on your block, we're asking you to stop in and hand them up and ask them to post. We want everyone to know about our parade and um, festivities in the park. Uh, okay. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, May 9th, at the community board at 3 p.m. So that is the second Thursday, May 9th, 3 p.m. And our meeting was adjourned at 5.58 p.m. And I want to touch base on one thing before I hand the mic over, and that is the greenest block in Brook Contest. Last year, I was 
asked by the Brooklyn Botanic Garden to be a judge of blocks, greenest blocks. And I was somewhat disappointed because all the blocks that I had to go and see and judge, we only had one, one block from Bushwick that actually was <coughs> participating in this contest. They represent Bushwick. We need our block associations to get involved with this. If you look at the um, um, community board's newsletter, the information is on there, but I can also give you the um, website is um, www.bbg.org slash community slash greenest blocks. I'm hoping and I'm praying that we will have more blocks to participate so that they can see that Bushwick has it on just like Bed-Stuy and all the others. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention on my report the CERT team, they are looking for volunteers to come out and take the training because CERT is the emergency respond unit. So if something happens, a disaster or something, we'll have people in Bushwick that would know what to do and how to do it and everything. So they are looking for people. I just had one problem with this, would you call it organization? They don't do it in Spanish. So I wasn't happy with that because, you know, you can't just have something in English and it's a disaster in an uh, area like Bushwick that is predominantly Spanish. So, you know, I was like, you know, they have to change this method that they say they only do training in Spanish and, I mean, in English and no other language. But if you want to volunteer, you can volunteer. You can go on 311, get all the information. They're looking for people as many as possible to join this CERT. Team. Thank you. My name is Mary McClellan, and the only thing I have to add to it in lieu of the time is ditto to all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to all of our committee chairperson reports. Moving on now to agenda item number seven, that's recommendations. So we heard that there were two hold recommendations from our public safety committee. One was for 65 Irving. And then the other one was for 33 Wyckoff Avenue. Okay, is there a motion from the board for that recommendation? Yep. To, su to support, motion to support the recommendation. Is there a second? All in favor? Oh. Okay. Okay, so, so let's let Barbara Smith reiterate the, the Public Safety Committee recommendations. I have two different sites, 33 Wyckoff and 65 Irvin. 65 Irvin hasn't been built yet, the one where I told the owner to go back and try to get his neighbors to come around because they're already getting petitions that he doesn't even open. And then the other site, he came to the table and we had some kind of situation where we just received the letter after my public safety committee meeting that the community were not happy with his establishment. So I have to ha go back and discuss this with the complaintant before we can approve a letter of approval for this site, 33 Wyckoff. Understandable, everybody? Yeah. To put them on hold, you see? Because the letter just came into the board from a complaint after my public safety committee meeting. Everybody understands now? Yep. Yep. Okay, so. Okay, so we had the motion was made for support of that recommendation by Ms. Annette Spellen and seconded by Ms. Barbara Jackson. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. And now we have another item of business this evening. We've been speaking for several months now about our bylaws, so I defer to our chairperson, Mr. Camacho, and I defer to our parliamentarian, Mr. Oldoff Wright. Well, I'm gonna pass the buck to Mr. Wright, our parliamentarian. Thank you. All right, 
these bylaws proposals were mentioned in our last meeting. Um, and so it's been presented to you, and this will be the third time that it's being presented, so um, we need to vote on these proposals. Has anybody got a copy? All right, who does not have a copy? Come and get it. Yes. It's already in your packet. It's already in your packet. Already in your packet. And also, we gave it last month. We gave it the month before that one. Before we sat down, we broke it down. So you should know that by heart because you took it home and you read it. Well, that's another story. That's, that's, that's why we need to make sure that uh, we take the stuff home, that we tell you I read it. Uh, and that's why we don't want to waste any more time and continue uh, to vote on this. Thank you. All right. Now, since it's been read three times, it is now time to vote. It's been read three times, three different meetings. It is now time to vote. And I know most of you have not even read it. All right, so are there any questions? No. All right, I, well, okay, if there's no questions, I have a motion on the floor. Can I get a motion? I make a motion that we accept the revised laws as stated on the draft. All right, we have Mr. Brown, who has given the motion. Ms. Julie Dent has seconded. All in favor of the proposed bylaws, uh, recommendations, changes, say aye. Aye. Opposes, nay. It has now passed, and immediately these bylaws are now part of a documentation for community board for. And that, and that concludes our recommendation portion. We'll now move down now to agenda item number eight, that's old business. Is there any old business from the board? <laughs> Seeing none, we'll move down to agenda item number nine, that's new business. It's time to do an election. We have to do the ad hoc committee. Uh, it's been a whole year. So it's been a year already. So hopefully uh, May is the vote. So uh, we got to get an ad hoc committee going on. If there are anybody that wants to be part of the committee, Please raise your hand now. Uh, uh, Barbara Smith. Anybody else? Uh, who else? Ms. McCullen. Oh, Mrs. Um, a, a Pastor oh, Reverend Nate. Come on, could you just speak on what the ad hoc committee does? Yeah. All right, so just so we get clarity, the ad hoc committee is essentially the nominating committee. We'll be having a vote next month so that everyone in our current positions can humbly serve you all again, as we have did over this past year. We've had our ups and downs, but we look forward to a straightforward process as we wrap our year up. But it's a nominating committee or election committee. So those helping to draft the people who are running for their positions, just essentially admin work. And if you're on the committee, you can't run. You cannot run 
for office. If you're on the committee, you cannot run for office. That's also on the city charter. All right. Clear. Anybody else? The more the merrier. Anybody else? Yeah. It was very helpful. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Announcements, 1.5 seconds, please. <laughs> My clock is ticking. Oh, I'm sorry. 1.5 minutes, I'm sorry. Five seconds. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Noel Elaine. I'm the artistic director of the Bushwick Star Theater. We're at 207 Star Street between uh, Irving and Wyckoff. I'm here to announce our Big Green Theater Festival, which is uh, an annual festival. It's the culmination of our uh, after school program. Uh, we work with uh, fourth and fifth grade students at PS 239 and PS 75, uh, writing uh, plays that uh, are based on uh, issues around climate change that they learn about over the course of the winter. We work with them from January to March, writing these plays, and then we put them on the theater with adult actors and uh, a fully staged production. The performances are free, and uh, it's uh, great for kids of all ages. Uh, we have free performances on Saturday and Sunday, the 27th and 28th at 1 and 4. I invite you to come out, bring your kids, um, come support these kids, be there with their families. They'd love to see you there. We'd love to see you there. So thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. And there's cards right on the table over here. Uh, Lorenzo Bray again from Councilmember Espinal's office. If you want to sign up for his e-newsletter, you can just see me after the meeting. Thank you. Evening, everyone. My name is Ramon. I'm with the Office of uh, State Senator Julia Salazar. We've got flares for the event that he was talking about here on the budget. So it's Tuesday at Mayday Space, 30 p.m. over at uh, Mayday Space 126, Nicholas Anu, Kimrod. Okay, so come by, come ask questions. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Kevin Worthington, the lad at Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation. Hey, my friend Bruno Garcia, who's here, are tenant organizers. We went to build help tenants being harassed by their landlord pushed out this place um, and thank you to that information with your neighbors if there's anyone right now who's being evicted who is suffering from harassment or conditions of disrepair can come to our office we are at 455 Merrill Avenue on the second floor we provide free legal services for qualifying low-income tenants yeah and just to get back on what Kevin said um, we also help in the development of tenant associations every building community should have its own tenant association it's the best only way to fight um, against displacement and eviction in our community um, but yeah, like Kevin said, we're going to have full back cards over there and stop by our office on 1455 Mer And I also want to thank you guys because you guys are, are the forefront for us that are being pushed out and helping our people to continue staying here. And without you guys, uh, we don't know. I have uh, used your services, have been grateful to some of the people in the and they told me it's good to have young uh, uh, kids really to push and ready to go and fight for our people that are being pushed out. And we appreciate you. You know how much. Uh, uh, we used at our public housing developments for our elevators uh, for infrastructure needs. Uh, so as a result of, of that proposal, the Congresswoman is leading her colleagues, the entire New York delegation, in pushing back against these, uh, these proposals. And I hope to have some sort of update uh, for you in the coming days. This is a, a major priority for the Congresswoman, for she has several public housing developments from Sunset Park all the way to Woodhaven. There are several public housing developments. So again, she's leading. Uh, her colleagues, the entire New York delegation, against uh, the Trump administration on these proposals. But additionally, next week, Friday, April 26, uh, the members putting together a Census 2020 Community Roundtable. Uh, that is at 11.30 a.m. in the church right behind the 83rd Precinct. That is 484 Knickerbocker Avenue. Bushwick and Williamsburg have long been one of the most undercounted neighborhoods uh, uh, in the borough and in the city. Uh, and have resulted in, a, in, a, in an undercounting of, of, who's, of how many people are living here, thus affecting the funding that comes down to, from the federal government. So it's important that you know, we have all hands on deck. It's a neighborhood uh, uh, initiative. Everyone needs to, to be in uh, on, uh, on making sure that everyone gets counted. So the event is this Friday. I have flyers in the bank. Thank you. I gave you more than enough time. <laughs> Thank you. If I had the big gorilla here, it would have died a long time ago. <laughs> Good evening. Um, the Brooklyn Borough President unveiled results from the first ever high school participatory budgeting problem. So um, if anybody is interested in that, uh, please reach me afterwards or talk to me afterwards. The Borough President also um, some time ago convened a committee 
on Census 2020. Brooklyn was severely undercounted. We're looking to make sure that doesn't happen again in 2020, but we need your help. We have the hashtag Make Brooklyn Count campaign. Oh, and by the way, whenever we say Make Brooklyn Count, everybody usually responds 100%. I'm going to say it again. Make Brooklyn Count. 100%. Excellent. We need your help. We need organizations, block association, churches, anybody who has contact with a lot of people. We need a representative to come to be a part of the committee that it has been formed for this campaign. If you are interested, please see me afterward and I will connect you with Pastor Munros in our office who is the lead on this initiative. Narcan training. We are still doing Narcan trainings for 2019 because we got the numbers for 2017 and they have increased mm -hmm. in terms of those who are dying mm -hmm. from opioid addiction. I'd like to thank board members, Barbara Smith and Mary McLennan, I believe that was it, um, that took the training. They are now certified opioid responders. We need more, we need more in the community. So I urge each and every one of you, make sure you have a packet. Inside is a listing of all the opio um, um, excuse me, all the Narcan trainings. Next one is April 22nd at the Central uh, Library at um, Grand Army Plaza. And plus we will have others. Now for the seniors in the house, major event coming up. May 7th, Senior Tech Fair. When I tell you that we're looking for this to be huge because seniors need to know more about technology, we don't want them being left out. So make sure you grab a packet. I am sending the final invitation to the board office. They just approved it today. That has the link to RSVP. You must RSVP because this is going to be attended by a lot of seniors. We want to make sure you're there. Thank you very much for your time. Question. Question. <laughs> See, I was trying to do it within a minute and a half. No, um, the date of the senior technology. Oh, yes. Um, yes. There is a flyer that has been circulated around about the bridge walk, which is supposedly in collaboration with the borough president's office. The borough president's office knows nothing about this. The seal that's on here is a clear seal of the borough president, which indicates that we didn't okay it because we always send high resolution seals. So please be on the lookout, I ask, of the community and the board office, that whenever you see a flyer that has the borough president's name on it and the seal doesn't look very clear, alert our office about it. I'd like to thank Barbara Smith for alerting us about it. I will be taking it back to the office to find out what happened. Now, maybe somebody did contact somebody in our office, but they didn't go through the proper channels because that seal should be very clear. Thank you very much. And did I say the Senior Tech Fair is May, May 7th, sorry. 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Okay. Hi everyone, hi again. Um, my name is Kayleen. I'm from a home care, a licensed home care agency, Elite Home Care. We're located in Brooklyn, but we're all over in all five boroughs. Just here to sh share some information. If anybody has a loved one, anyone they know um, interested in a home care attendant, physical therapy in the house, or nowadays, I know it can be frustrating, you can get paid to take care of your loved one through the CDPAP program with Medicaid. So it, there's a lot of services out there. We do take um, Medicaid, Medicare, and a lot of the home attendants are specialized in Spanish, Creole, Italian, um, the major languages. So if anybody has any questions, any concerns, I have a lot of goodies, um, tchotchkes I'm trying to give away, so please feel free to stop by. Thanks. And, and thank you for waiting, Ashley. But I'm gonna allow you a couple of more seconds, you know, thank you, uh, Mr. to speak. To speak, all right. I'm we'll try sorry. one more time. I, I'm sorry for. All right. Thank you. Um, good evening again, everyone. My name is Asher Freeman from Councilmember Reynoso's office, and I just wanted to say a few words about the presentation from the Department of City Planning. Uh, as many of you may know, the council member has been fighting to protect manufacturing jobs since he got into office. Now, why is he doing that? 
it's not because he has a nostalgia for factories. Uh, it's the jobs and the workers in that sector. Um, these jobs pay on average double what the service sector pays, double. Okay, so they serve as a uh, protection from displacement that has run so rampant in this community. These are also local jobs. People walk to these jobs, they can bike to these jobs. And four out of five workers in, this, in the industrial sector are people of color. So it's very important that we protect these workers and these jobs um, because they do provide an incredible resource for our community and uh, protect against displacement. Now in 2015, uh, council members secured a commitment from the city to study uh, this area to look at protecting it because currently things like uh, nightlife and retail uh, are all allowed um, in this area and so we've seen a lot of that come in and displace businesses. Um, fast forward to this past November, the city released its report and now we've seen their zoning framework. Uh, the zoning framework really um, in a nutshell is opening the floodgates in the areas that the developers are most interested in building commercial office space and nightclubs and things like that and putting in protections in the more uh, heavy industrial areas where we have you know, the wastewater treatment plants and the waste transfer stations. So it's not to say that those areas don't need protection, but we really think that it's a bit backwards that they're not protecting the areas where we're already seeing a lot of development now. Um, so as it stands, the council member does not support the plan. Um, we still feel that those protections for the industrial area are very necessary and we're gonna continue to fight to get them. Um, so we're hopeful that we'll have some more productive conversations with the city in the coming months, but currently uh, their plan is not something we can support, uh, but we certainly look forward to having further conversations with the board as they refine their study. Thank you. And, and, I, sure, and, and I may say that it was this community board five or six years ago that requested that we do that and make sure that uh, uh, the zoning changes there and make sure that our people are not pushed out and make sure we don't have Manhattan and Brooklyn and Bushwick when it wasn't there. So we wanted to just rename it. It was this community board that did it. So we need to work close to help you, to help us. And that's, what, that's our main goal and that's my goal here to make sure that we all can continue living here. And we need, we need the jobs because my father worked in a factory and he raised nine kids in a factory job on Lexington when it used to be the watch factory right off of, of Best Stuy. So if you guys remember, so we need those jobs and we want to make sure that their interest is the community's interest. Oh, good evening. I'm coming at you wearing a couple of hats. It starts with the Department of Health. Um, I'm not going to talk to you about the mental health stuff, but I also want to talk about the the, the noxaline, the, the opioid um, overdose stuff. If Z was here, she would be telling you that she's training people who want to be um, the first responders for the overdose uh, uh, kits, while the public health office that's that's here in Bushwick on 335 Central, right up the street, is being like revitalized. Um, She's kind of floating around. So she's actually willing to go out and do trainings for agencies and community groups. She will come to you to organize and do those trainings. It's totally free. She brings the kits. Um, if, like I said, if, if she was here, she'd be telling you the same thing. So please catch up with her about that. Um, and if you need to, and you, you can come and see me, and then I'll make sure to get that information to her. The second thing I want to talk about is what the work I'm doing with Family Service Network of New York. Um, <coughs> I've come a couple of times to talk about the BOA project, the, the uh, Brownfield Opportunity Area project that's happening here in Bushwick. That's currently in its second phase. Um, we've put together a steering committee and I just wanted to throw out a date. Uh, May 2nd, we're looking to have a community forum. We're still looking to, to nail down the, the location, but um, just wanted to put it out there. Uh, some of you guys are part of the steering committee um, and we will be depending on some of those people to get the word out as well as the community board for the upcoming meeting. It should be in the evening on May 2nd, um, and we're, like I said, we're still working on the venues. We definitely want the community to come out. We're trying to extend the good work that everybody did with the Bushwick Community Plan. Um, Hester Street is one of the partners who's working with us, as well as Grain Collective, Family Service Network in New York, and then you know we wanna make sure that the community's involved as well. So that's it, thank you.
Uh, so the Community Education Council wants to announce their next uh, CEC meeting that's happening. It's going to be on May 23rd at location IS-383, Philippa Schuyler. Um, the address is 1300 Green Avenue. The guest school will be IS-291. And there's also another uh, announcement that CEC are asking all parents who have children with IPs that due to the class action lawsuit brought against the uh, New York Department of Education, any student will have special education services or IEPs um, in this class action lawsuit are requiring that DOE provide any student with disability or IEPs to have their information shared. And majority of the time, if the student is, um, or the parents unaware of this, their information would be shared with this class action lawsuit and whatever is the final judgment on this, um, that's pretty much it. So for those who have individual things that they're gonna do or sue the DOE, um, they would prefer that parents just opt out of this or want to be part of this class action lawsuit that is currently happening. Um, so this was an email sent in from the ECC forwarded to the CEC and um, I'm letting everybody know for those who have students in public schools with special education or IEPs um, to be aware of this of what's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. All right. WPIX, everybody listen to the news? WPIX in the morning? All right. They have a contest. The school I work at, P5, is one of two schools that are participating in this contest. First prize, $11,000, second prize, $5,000. And everybody gets to vote. <laughs> wow, I ain't hear nothing there. Everybody gets to vote. Yeah, yeah. So on the 29th, they're going to announce the two schools. They're going to present it to on air on the 29th. And then you have the next week to vote. P remember PS5. <laughs> remember PS5. When you go to WPI, gets to vote. Thank you. Yo, we got a cut. Uh, the contest is making a difference. And the students made a difference by the shower bus. The shower bus. They went to Borough Hall, um, Borough Hall a couple weeks ago, made a presentation to the uh, Borough President. And so that's one of the majors that uh, they put as making a difference. And they, they tore it up. I mean, they, they weren't even rehearsed. So remember, PS5. Okay, I'm cheating a little bit. Somebody mentioned jobs. One of the things I forgot about mention, U.S. Census is hiring like crazy. There are announcements are coming to the board of this. Okay, good. I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that, um, and um, please consider the possibility of having a census job fair like we did. Okay? Thank you. Okay, that concludes announcement. We're now moving to second roll call. Before I begin, this is a reminder to please pick up all of the things that you brought with you, any of the garbage that's there. Hope is kind enough to host us in the facility, and we want to continue to remain their partner. And seniors say that's going to use it in the morning, so we're going to make sure we clean up. Whatever bottle, everything, please keep it clean. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Now for the second roll call. Race Eights, L.A. Blacksmith, Oscar Brown, Robert Camacho, Present. Felix Ibas, Cartier Gephardt, Melissa Carrera, Lisa Chan, Sufia Chowdhury, Present. 